Hi everyone, I'm Julia. I'm a chapter organizer at the Sierra Club SF Bay chapter. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Josh. I am the chapter intern and I've been working with Julia uh, for a few months now and for the last couple of weeks we've been putting together uh, this webinar uh, because we've noticed a lot of energy in the uh, hub uh, around uh, the Green New Deal, uh, particularly from our Contra Costa hubs. Um, and we wanted to talk about what a Green New Deal for Contra Costa would mean and uh, how it links uh, today, uh, just because we can't do everything Green New Deal, uh, specifically how it relates to uh, transportation and housing issues. And to start us off, uh, we're going to uh, watch a little video, which Joy, I think, can uh, give us a little bit of context for. Yeah, so um, the, there is a lot of excitement right now around a Green New Deal. Um, and I think that some of the the misunderstanding around a Green New Deal is right now it's, it's a framework um, and there is a lot of policy to think about that would fit within this framework. Uh, and this video came out that really helps create a more imaginative narrative around what a Green, green New Deal might look like. And it's kind of trying to combat this obstacle that we want to achieve this big transformative change um, that a Green New Deal envisions, but there's also a lot of skepticism or feeling like pulling something off at this scale and speed is not possible. Um, and we just kind of wanted to get people imagining around what, what a Green New Deal could be. So there's this great video that's narrated by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and it's illustrated by a great climate activist and artist, Molly Crabapple. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's a video imagining what a world with a Green New Deal would look like. So we're gonna play that for all you. Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing, and it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, 
when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. So this video is ob obviously um, really tries to illustrate what this future that we're aiming for that we can't necessarily imagine or see right now could look like. And I, I actually have watched this video a couple of times and I haven't in a while and it feels even more salient now with the current crisis and thinking about how we are going to recover from this um, and thinking about 
a green recovery definitely gives more backing to a Green New Deal. Um, so what is the Green New Deal? We're gonna go through the basic pillars of it and um, really driving home that this is a framework and because this framework does have a lot of popularity, especially in, here in the Bay Area, it's really important for us to be thinking about how, how we build out policy within this framework to achieve the goals of a Green New Deal. And um, we're gonna be examining, examining it from the issues of like land use around housing and transportation. So I'll pass it over to Josh to go through the pillars. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so the first pillar um, is really climate centric and it's combating the climate crisis by swiftly and justly transitioning to 100% renewable energy, investing in community electrification, and conserving our precious local ecosystems, decarbonizing our buildings and reducing toxic air and water pollutions. This is a huge, huge thing for the club. Obviously it aligns very closely with our mission, but it also aligns closely with the work that Julia and I do, particularly when it comes to uh, preserving open space and looking at how um, we can uh, really conserve space by uh, smart land use decisions. The second pillar it focuses around jobs and it's creating millions of good, clean and union jobs that bring prosperity and economic security for all of us. Um, this ties in closely with the work we've been doing, say around the Concord Naval Weapons Base, um, where we've been uh, really on the front lines pushing for a project labor agreement and for really a high road labor standards. The third pillar um, is a justice-based pillar um, and this is fighting racial, economic, and social inequity by stopping the current, preventing future, and repairing historic oppression of both indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, the deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, uh, the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused, people with disability, youth, and the list goes on. Um, and during this crisis, we've seen how these communities in particular have been really at the front lines of uh, when things hit the fan, uh, they are often the ones most um, impacted. And so now that we sort of know those three central pillars, we'll be referring back to them throughout the webinar. Um, but next, Julia is going to kind of uh, walk us through maybe thinking about uh, what a Green New Deal might mean to us. Yeah, so at its core, the Green New Deal is trying to solve these two major issues um, in our world and in our society here, which is combating the climate crisis um, and economic inequality. Um, and I think that this framework, if anyone has read the Green New Deal resolution, um, there are a lot of high level um, proposed legislation that we would try to achieve under this to, to accomplish that. Um, but I think that filling in the gaps like what a green new deal means to you is still left to be sorted out and that means different things here at the local level at the state level and federally so um i would like to invite people to put in the chat what a green new deal means to them um what what type of legislation or changes or what would a world with the green new deal look like um i invite you to share your ideas in the chat and also we will be following up this presentation with a, um, an exit survey, like feedback form, where we would like you to be thinking even more about this um, because how we envision a Green New Deal and what it means to us is so core to our organizing and we really see this platform as a winning strategy to really galvanize people to action around issues that we already work on. Um, so while people are thinking about that and maybe putting it in the chat or thinking about how they wanna share back later, um, I'm happy to talk about what the Green New Deal means to us here at the Sierra Club. Um, so, as I mentioned, the Green New Deal is a resolution. It's not a policy. It's providing this transformative framework um, of a proposal in the United, for United States legislation that would address climate change and economic inequality. Um, and as I've, I said, this is gaining more momentum. Green New Deal is backed by the Sierra Club at the national level and it's a national priority for this organization. Um, with the framework of the Green New Deal 
laid out, it's time to kind of build that out and think about how we're achieving these goals. And here at the Bay Area chapter, we'd really like to explore how the work we're already doing and the work that we could be doing would help us get Green New Deal policy locally. So feel free to keep putting your uh, thoughts in the chat uh, about what a Green New Deal means to you or to us. Um, but I'm gonna now, now walk us through a little bit of uh, what the Green New Deal language already is uh, around uh, the sectors of transportation and of housing. Um, so when it comes to transportation, the Green New Deal very explicitly touches on um, transportation specifically overhauling our transportation systems to make them uh, carbon free. Uh, this includes the zero emission vehicles, um, clean and affordable and accessible public transit and high speed rail. Um, so this is a really sort of central part for the Green New Deal um, and is really uh, important to the work that we do uh, here, especially because of all the regional transportation that um, we have uh, been relying on and that's uh, maybe not been keeping up to snuff necessarily with what we need. On the housing front, uh, the Green New Deal aims to provide all people of the United States with affordable, safe and adequate housing, um, which is huge and, and very broad, but uh, thankfully we do uh, already have some Green New Deal legislation on that front, which is the Green New Deal for Public Housing Act that was um, introduced a few months back, which is a huge investment in public housing that not only rejuvenates them but uh, rebuilds them in a sustainable way um, that provides funding for electrification, for uh, non-carbon energy, and to secure renewable energy sources for all the public housing needs. Um, and this uh, is set to help uh, the living conditions for nearly a million uh, public houses um, and two million people living in those uh, housing situations. Um, so these are just the sort of frameworks that uh, the Green New Deal provides sort of at the upper level when it comes to these two concepts. Um, so now we'll think about what a Green New Deal policy for transportation and housing might look like. Oh, you're muted, Julia. Sorry, everyone. We want to explore a little bit um, the, the kind of land use policy related to transportation and housing that would help achieve the, the high level goals of the Green New Deal while thinking about um, economic equality as well. So we're going to explore that through um, a couple of policies we've been thinking about. Yeah, so there's a lot of transportation specific priorities that the club has identified that our chapter has uh, been working on uh, for a long time, um, specifically uh, focused around uh, land use and uh, compact mixed use land use that prioritizes uh, multimodal and walking and biking over uh, personal vehicles. Uh, but the also uh, policies we've also been looking at are obviously building and um, increasing our public transit, uh, particularly when it comes to increasing operations funding for our public transit, uh, reducing and eliminating parking. Uh, as we know, that's a huge drain on uh, the sort of land mass that we're able to uh, use effectively. Uh, we try to increase shared vehicle usage and we try to increase vehicle electrification. Our EV program is pretty uh, fantastic. Uh, and as we've all seen in the last few weeks, um, telecommuting is something that's very necessary for a lot of people um, and is a necessary part of a green future. Um, so thinking about telecommuting as a transportation solution and not just as a sort of emergency response to a pandemic uh, is something we've been working on. Uh, we also talk uh, a lot about um, equitable promotion of alternatives. So that would be things like free bus passes for students and seniors. Um, and trying to minimize the impacts on and the use of our land um, to help preserve open space and um, maintain the beautiful uh, natural landscape, uh, particularly of the Bay Area. Um, it also ties into our anti-sprawl work. Um, as we all know, 
the club has a long and uh, wonderfully successful history of uh, being anti-sprawl um, and sprawl, as we know, promotes automobile dependence and destroys our ecosystems. It's uh, an unsafe building practice, as we've seen. It's increased um, dangers for communities that have sprawled into wildfire zones um, in California. It increases social inequity, reduces our security, and of course, uh, increases carbon emissions. Um, and it's directly uh, related to the first pillar of the Green New Deal in combating the climate crisis by conserving our precious local ecosystems. Sprawl is pretty antithetical um, to that conservation mindset and is um, antithetical to what the club believes in, in, in many, many ways. Um, and ties also to density and infill work, um, which are somewhat the uh, counterpoints uh, to sprawl. Uh, they help reduce vehicle miles traveled and the emissions from VMTs and help support our transit infrastructure, our bike infrastructure, and um, putting pedestrians and those other uh, non-driving commuters first when it comes to land use planning. It increases quality of life and improves public health. And of course, it helps preserve open space. So we really believe wholeheartedly in um, high density wherever possible um, and in infill. Uh, as we know, the, the club has a really strong infill policy that we really believe in uh, as staff members. Um, Infill helps preserve our pastoral and natural lands and smart growth, you know, helps save us money uh, for both governments, businesses and uh, as residents. Um, and we believe really that uh, development should be dense, inclusive and located within or connected to uh, the existing communities and neighborhoods that we have and help support the transportation in those regions. Finally, uh, we want to talk about green oriented zoning um, that links into all the other slides I, I, I've just run through, um, particularly when it comes to limiting sprawl. Um, one of the strongest tools we have are urban growth boundaries. Um, they really help us um, maintain our um, way of life and stop sort of rampant um, outward growth um, rather than upward growth. Um, we think that development should be allowed at the highest densities wherever possible, uh, particularly within walking and bicycling distance of transit stations. And we think that uh, exclusionary single family home zoning um, helps uh, reduce our capacity to uh, be transit walkable, bikeable, um, and increases our greenhouse gases and uh, really perpetuates the climate crisis, um, as well as perpetuates inequity by pricing out workers uh, from being able to live close to job centers. Thanks, Josh. And yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting how a lot of these policies that help um, fill out the Green New Deal framework are things that people have been working on for so long, including the Sierra Club, but a lot of other organizations, especially in the Bay Area, agree that this this is the path forward for how our communities grow and thrive. Um, so for here, for mixed use communities, that just kind of ties a lot of these ideas together into into what um, our communities can and should look like. Um, it's actually really nice to see a picture with all these people gathering. Um, but we really want to emphasize that in in a world with the Green New Deal, obviously these spaces already exist, but we need to emphasize that our, both our cities and our towns are places where people can live, they can work, and they can thrive while protecting and restoring our natural environment and fighting the causes and impacts of climate change. So mixed use communities could look like um, these spaces where there's retail or office space, um, restaurants on the ground floor and then re residences above so that people can be walking, uh, have a lot of walk to amenities, just walk to their corner store or to their office. Um, in a lot of places we want to make sure that mixed use communities provide um, a lot of walk to and bike to destinations and are also situated near reliable and frequent public transportation. And then the idea of having complete streets that prioritize pedestrians over cars, where we're really activating the space we have. Um, it makes you realize how, how much space 
that we need to fill in with concrete we actually need um, when we're not prioritizing that space for our roads and cars. So eliminating this dependency on needing to like get out and around through um, single occupancy vehicles and thinking more about how do we situate things in a way that makes sense um, for us to improve our quality of life, bring our communities together, um, and yeah, reduce our emissions. Another, and then another piece that we're gonna talk about is the jobs housing balance. So this is, this is a really big issue, especially here in the Bay Area. Um, a jobs, house, jobs housing balance is basically talking about the ratio of jobs to housing in a given area. So ideally we wanna be balancing jobs and housing, not only within the region, but within these sub areas of a region, right? So in, in Contra Costa County, the jobs and housing ratio is not balanced. There is more housing than jobs. Um, and then in place in job centers like San Francisco and Oakland, there are much more jobs to housing. So we're, we're seeing this problem where people are basically becoming super commuters, not because they want to drive or travel on public transit for multiple hours to get to their office, but because that those two things are imbalanced. Um, and it's, it lends itself also to af affordability, right? So housing becomes more affordable as it's further away from these job centers. So if we really wanna be tackling these issues of economic inequality with people not being able to afford to live where they work, and then this issue of people really sacrificing their own health, physical, mental health, to be making these super commutes that also contribute to traffic congestion and more emissions, we need to be thinking about how to achieve a jobs housing balance, which kind of, it relates back to the Green New Deal pillars. I think especially pillar two of creating millions of good clean union jobs to bring prosperity and economic security for all. Um, there are opportunities to promote job growth in a place like Contra Costa County and, and thinking about the refinery corridor and what a a just transition away from that would look like. I mean, that's a whole other piece of this, and I think Steve's a great person to talk to. Um, but I, yeah, I, I just want to reiterate that the jobs housing balance is um, something that would need to be addressed to achieve our vision under Green New Deal. And as I mentioned, there's this problem of affordable housing in the Bay Area. Obviously, most of you, I'm sure, know that there is a housing crisis here. And Sierra Club believes that affordable housing is a human right, which means that no member of our community should be unhoused. Um, and we also live in an area with this drive till you qualify housing market, which means that people have to live further and further away from job centers to be able to afford a place to live. Um, that is harmful for both people and the environment. Um, and affordable housing near transit is so important because it is our, our low income residents who rely on public transit most heavily. And it makes sense for both our transit systems, especially our buses to, um, to support the populations that use them most. Um, so we definitely need to be thinking about affordable housing as a means to really support public transit and to support the people who use it. It's, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship there. Um, and there's this point of new proposed employment center should be required to contribute to affordable housing programs. This is a piece of Sierra Club's policy, but it, it is very relatable here. And I think it really does relate to the Green New Deal framework to be providing um, economic equality and opportunity to all. And then we want to draw back to the point about um, good quality union jobs. So supporting the right to organize and promote quality union jobs and livable wages so that people can afford to live where they work and so that people building housing um, do, have, do have a good quality job and uh, have the right to organize. So that's how affordable housing fits into this. And then finally, equity should be 
the lens in which we look through every issue we work on. But when it comes to land use decisions, we recognize that many national and local land use policies were designed to separate people by race and class. So we have an obligation to address past and ongoing inequity in communities and neighborhoods that are most damaged by this separation and to fully engage these folks as stakeholders in their communities on this work. So policies should ensure that people from low income, disadvantaged, marginalized, and communities of color have equitable access to quality of life services that are essential for their overall, oh, for their overall well-being, for economic advancement, and also for dealing with the impacts of climate change. Um, I think right now we're seeing how in times of crisis, it's the, the most vulnerable and the frontline communities being hit first and worst. And um, unfortunately, when thinking about future crises that will come from climate change, we do need to be thinking about how we better respond to put equity at the forefront so that this does not happen again. So achieving equity in land use planning um, would, would mean providing all with access to transit, to affordable housing and educational and economic opportunities. That's key to achieving pillar three of the Green New Deal, which means we are fighting racial, economic and social inequality by stopping current, preventing future and repairing historic oppression. So, we need to be looking at all these policies that we're talking about through an equity lens because um, we are only as strong as the most vulnerable person in our population. Um, so this is another question I wanted to pose for everyone. Um, obviously, we talked about a lot of issues and potential policies to address them and how they relate to a Green New Deal. Um, but we want to hear from you in Contra Costa County, especially because we want to build leadership out there and work with our committees out there um, to push this framework because we think it helps bring more people on board. So we wanna know what are major transportation housing issues that exist in Contra Costa, whether it be something we already mentioned or something we missed. Um, we'd love for you to put it in the chat or there'll be also be a space in the feedback form to, if you wanna think more about this or how to frame it. Um, we really do want to get a better sense of what you what you all as residents um, feel about the issues in your county and how they relate to the framework we're presenting. So Steve said, not enough low-income housing, not enough housing density, far too little affordable public transit, not enough funding for public transit, and of course, inequality. Yeah, I, th I think that certainly names a lot of issues. Yeah, and these are not unique uh, to Contra Costa by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Um, and and please feel free to keep um, peppering in your thoughts. Um, but what we've sort of identified um, when it comes to sort of real challenges um, in Contra Costa that maybe um, separate it from other areas um, that we work with um, is that this real sort of culture of super commuting, um, you know, Contra Costa has the longest average commutes in the Bay Area and that is uh, almost doubled when you think about uh, those who are transit reliant, those who take public transit uh, spend uh, half an hour longer in their commute than um, regular, uh, not regular, car-based uh, commuters in Contra Costa. So that's really led uh, to a lack of time and access for citizens to really become involved in that community. And we've seen um, that that's really hampered um, sort of local organizing efforts um, because there's just not enough uh, time in the day to be spending three hours commuting, having a job and having a life and trying to organize on top of that. It's been really difficult as what we've seen. Uh, we also have seen a history of environmentalism in that region um, has been tied to real uh, development skepticism. And we're not saying that skepticism is unwarranted, um, but with the club moving away from uh, a no growth mindset to a smart growth mindset, um, it's still hard to, to break some of those old patterns. 
um, and to break some of those old um, assumptions that uh, those who we would be organizing with uh, have about the environmental movement in Contra Costa. Obviously, um, we've seen the lack of public transit infrastructure um, that really um, hampers people's ability to be mobile in the region um, and the massive uh, imbalance of jobs and housing um, makes quality of life um, harder to be um, really robust. Um, finally, we've also noted and have been uh, made aware of a sort of lack of informational resources centered on Contra Costa County and those uh, that are in the region have um, not always been the most reputable. Um, particularly, we've seen this in Antioch where um, those who we've uh, talked to have expressed a real uh, dissatisfaction with the sort of local reporting and the local um, sort of news messaging when it comes to uh, environmental issues. So those are things that we've sort of identified um, in the work that we've been doing in Contra Costa um, recently. Um, and so uh, we just wanted to sort of highlight those um, and uh, sort of if you have any other challenges that you see, please feel free to throw those in the chat. Um, but moving away past those challenges, uh, we want to think about how we can best uh, move forward and support Green New Deal efforts in Contra Costa and you know throughout the Bay Area. Um, I think that video does a really good job of showing how that uh, envisioning process um, and storytelling of thinking about how a Green New Deal would really positively impact our region um, can be a powerful tool for um, inspiration and for uh, creating optimism. So uh, us on staff um, are a really great resource when it comes to helping uh, promote or publish um, op-eds or blog posts um, centered on uh, sort of links between a Green New Deal and maybe more uh, nuanced local issues throughout Contra Costa. And if we can sort of tell these stories that wind together um, public health and the Green New Deal and national electoral politics with our local um, policies, uh, we can really uh, take those first steps um, to creating a really powerful um, progressive message of uh, around the Green New Deal. We also um, think that like this webinar and like the many that um, our staff are preparing um, to sort of help people stay engaged during this time of isolation, um, there's a lot of opportunities for leadership training, uh, especially um, for those of us in Contra Costa. I know that's been a region that we as uh, chapter staff um, have not spent enough time um, doing outreach to and coordinating with. So we really want to be um, putting that community um, first and foremost in our future work when it comes to Green New Deal work and into our training work. So um, we want to really uh, direct some of our training energy and our webinar capacity towards building leadership in Contra Costa. And of course, I'm sure all of you are already but if not, um, highly recommend subscribing to uh, our action alerts um, so that you can be pinged whenever there is an opportunity for activism uh, in your area. Thanks, Josh. And sorry, I haven't um, gotten to everybody's questions, um, but I'm taking note and I can be sure to follow up. Um, but what we really want to leave you with with this webinar, we're, we're really thinking of it as a first step to um, how we think about Green New Deal policy that be, could be solutions for your community. Um, we really think we really are finding that this Green New Deal framework is helping to bring more people into the fold of this and um, is exciting and encapsulates more issues beyond land use. Um, as I just mentioned in the chat, these are the issues that Josh and I work on in the chapter, but we also have other chapter organizers who do work related to Green New Deal. So we're kind of trying to think about how we bring, bring all these issues together more holistically. And while we don't know what, what you all think right now in terms of what policies could be solutions for your community at the moment, we want you to think about that and um, follow up with us in the form that we're sending out so that, um, 
we can get your feedback and think about how to formulate our next conversation, which will be more based around talking through these issues, more um, people coming to the table with more um, ideas around policy and yeah, just how a Green New Deal could help help with issues in your own community. So just want to like leave everybody with that. You're welcome to put into the chat if you have ideas now, but um, there's definitely going to be more time for conversation around this. And with that, uh, we just wanted to thank you all for taking the time uh, to chat with us um, and to um, be a part of this session. Uh, I know it's maybe a little funky with uh, the muting, but uh, we're still working on this and trying to maintain uh, everyone's uh, security. Uh, we know the Zoom bombers have been a real problem of late, so uh, we appreciate you guys uh, being patient with us. And again, as uh, Julia mentioned, we'll be sending out this um, exit survey following this. Um, call uh, and we would really appreciate y'all taking uh, the five, 10 minutes um, it takes to fill it out. Um, it'll be really valuable um, information for us, especially for those of you uh, all based in Contra Costa. Yeah, thank you everybody. Feel free to email me and it was really nice to see some folks um, who held the Green New Deal Town Hall out in Contra Costa. I think that there was a lot of excitement around that and it opens up a lot of opportunity to work on issues that we already work on but frame them in a way that really does help bring more people into leadership and advocacy um so we'll be sending you the slides as well so that you can take a look back at this and follow up um, for our actual conversation around this um and we'll just leave you with a slide that has some helpful resources um a lot of what we pulled from this what it was supported by Sierra Club's infill policy so we wanted to share that with you all and Josh included a lot of other links that were used in our research um, and these these are also at the end of the slide deck so you guys can actually click on these links once you have it yeah and that will be uh, readily available also on our um, survey as well and the uh, follow-up uh, up email so uh, again just thank you all for taking the time uh, we really appreciate you um, you know using your um, time to, to be with us in this space. Yeah, thank you everyone and have a lovely rest of your evening. Yeah, stay safe. Bye.